Okay, welcome everyone. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Project Orleans, this Orleans framework that I've been dev lead uh, since the beginning, so it's very dear to my heart. Um, who in the audience ever played the Halo game? Oh, that's good. So uh, the experience you're dealing with is very different from what's behind the scenes. So, so instead of explaining what I mean by saying Halo scale, I have this um, video that I'd like to show you at the beginning also to wake you up a little bit. So let's see if it plays. Halo is a rich, immersive story with millions of loyal and dedicated fans. We deliver an exciting and engaging experience to these fans. They need to know what the hot playlist is today. They need to know what the challenges are. They need to know where their friends have been, what their friends have been playing. Have their friends gotten more medals than them? They need to know all of this and they need to react to it and interact with their friends in real time. We need to deliver hundreds of thousands of updates per second to millions of players across the Halo universe. We need to get them the right information to the right device at the right time. There was nothing off the shelf that solved the problems we needed to solve at the scale we needed to solve them. So we turned to Microsoft's Extreme Computing Group. Hundreds of thousands of requests per second across thousands of servers in real time. These guys are crazy. But in Extreme Computing, those are the kind of challenges we we'll like to tackle. Uh, as you can probably tell, that video was a couple of years, maybe a couple of years before, so I was younger. Uh, <laughs> right? uh, but I think uh, the coup gives a very good idea of what actually we're talking about. We're talking uh, scale um, of Halo and those kind of services. So we're going to be talking about the cloud, obviously, and people give these definitions of the cloud. By the way, um, we're also going to be playing the game. Uh, we're going to be playing the game Name the Tune. Who knows Name the Tune? No, so <laughs> when you see when they see uh, in the top uh, right corner uh, a sentence in quotes, if you can, if you know what uh, song it's from, or at least what the band uh, that played it, just yell it, and the, somebody who gets the most uh, answers right will get the beer at the party. <laughs> so there is a prize. So just yell. This one's the hardest one. I promise you. Uh, anybody knows? Anybody got the power? No, that's actually from David Bowie. Uh, actually, it's also my test for the age of the audience, just to get a sense. <laughs> well, no. no Justin Bieber, no Taylor Swift, that, no Abba either. Uh, I, you don't want me to sing on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. So when we talk about the cloud, um, really like, the essence of the cloud is that you get this uh, enormous resources available to you uh, to rent. So that's why everyone's got the power to get almost infinite amount of resources, as long as you have a credit card you can charge uh, to pay for the services. This power has been available to major corporations or governments for a like, decade, but now anybody can do it. A small startup can suddenly grow from nothing to uh, called unicorn. I hate the term, but they call them unicorn, right? But with great power, uh, as they say, comes great responsibility. So to build uh, systems at that scale, you, you face uh, new challenges or new, all challenges in a new form. Like, for example, concurrency. Like, who in the audience enjoys debugging uh, multi-threaded code and data races and deadlocks? I don't. I, I'm just kidding. But now, who likes to do that on a distributed setting when you have logs from, say, 20 machines and they're trying to figure out what happened? That's the order of magnitude more difficult than just attaching debugger and finding that deadlock or, or the data race. So you have these issues of distributing your computations concurrency at scale, failures are the norm, right, in, in the cloud. What used to be happening maybe every few years, or every few months, now those failures happen every day, depending on your scale, because machines get rebooted, they get patched. You see it as a failure oftentimes. So there, there is a set of new challenges that we haven't seen before. And then uh, when businesses look and try to figure out uh, what to do with this, all that Glitters is gold, name the tune. Thank you. That's great. One point. Uh, so you hear this cacophony of all these analysts and uh, consultants and talking heads saying, here's the solution. Like, for example, a few years ago, people were saying, you see, Facebook was built with PHP and MySQL. So if you use these technologies, so you can build anything, right? They built Facebook. SOAP, even a few years even before that, web services and SOAP, they were supposed to solve all the problems in the world. 
all good technologies, don't get me wrong, these technologies are fine, but when somebody says that this technology will help you uh, build a cloud scale solution, I look at it as they're trying to sell you this elevator, or if you watched uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, like Wonka Vader, where there's this button and you go up and out, that solves all the problem. Um, like for example, Go, right, is the new, um, the, the hipster language, uh, programming language. I don't know why it's... Uh, because Docker is written in Go, so again, if you write in Go, you need to learn Go and that will solve your problem. Of course not, that's not the case. Uh, and then the, you see other comments like, oh, you have to be stateless. Or uh, observation that microservices as a term, a good term, a good architectural term, got abused too fast. And this is my favorite, so Mary Jo Foley, thanks Mary Jo. She said that the release would solve all the cloud problems back in 2010. That's my favorite one. Um, <laughs> but then you see this picture. Uh, who has heard Kyle Kingsbury talking about Jepson? Call me maybe. Great. So if you have never watched, go to YouTube, search Kyle Kingsbury, uh, Jepson, Call me maybe. You will not regret. Everyone who deals with the cloud has to watch this talk. It's a brilliant guy. He just single-handedly showed that all this, pretty much all open source distributed databases that are available, they all don't uh, maintain their guarantees in case of network partitions. He got his beefy machine in his apartment and run all this commercially available open source software in the set of EMs, and he recorded reads and writes to these uh, databases while he was partitioning connections between those VMs simulating actual network partitions and node failures. And he shows that every single one, like our MongoDB, uh, uh, Redis, uh, Elastic Search, all these technologies break down and violate loose data, violate their guarantees. So he showed this picture of tire fire. And he explains that at the top of it, uh, at the API level of the database, you have this rainbows and unicorns. Everything's fine from the API perspective. But if you look underneath, under the cover, there's this tire fire of code that doesn't really uh, maintain its guarantees. So you look at that and it, it's very hard to, to decide what to do. That, that's the reality of our industry. Uh, in my view, if you stack back, there's this triangle of uh, really concerns. You have compute, you have state, and you have connectivity. And there are many choices. Like You, you have to make these trade-offs. Who are you, what have you sacrificed? Name the tune. Jesus Christ Superstar, because you need to sacrifice something to get something. For example, uh, batch processing is, is very efficient. Uh, if, if you can afford uh, high latency, if you can process within minutes, hours, you can be extremely efficient by putting a lot of data and processing in the MapReduce way with Hadoop. But if you need sub-second latency, that doesn't work. You have to sacrifice this efficiency for uh, low latency. And, and these uh, challenges and, and trade-offs go on and on. Like databases, SQL is very good at transactions and guarantees, but it doesn't scale well. So key value stores are very good at uh, partitioning and scaling, but they don't provide usually secondary indexes that SQL does for you for free. So again, you need to get something, you need to sacrifice something to get something. I just highlighted what we sort of con were concerned with in the project Orleans, but then if you've heard of a CAP theorem, I hope everyone heard of the CAP theorem that says that you cannot get consistency and availability at the same time in the distributed system. That's pretty much the axiom. So this is the, the real challenge that we deal with when we talk about the cloud. And the solutions are different, right? So we, have, we can hire hero developers. In Years ago at Microsoft and developer division, we had a different term, we had Einstein developers, the category. These are people that can build uh, very complex systems. So somebody built Google, somebody built Facebook, somebody built uh, MSN and Hotmail and those kind of systems. So it is possible to, to tackle these uh, challenges and to build stuff. Uh, but those developers are rare and they're expensive and they're all happily employed. So if you try to build business by hiring a bunch of hero developers that can kind of solve all these problems, you can run out of budget very fast. But most likely, you won't be able to hire them because what's in the, for them to leave their uh, job they like and join your company. So in reality, when you try to hire people, um, you need to look at the available pool. Like who here a program in Erlang? OK, there's a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, I know Jan uh, did. Um, Scala. Yeah, one person, two, two people. F-sharp. Okay, more. 
but still a minority. So I have really sincere, deep respect for people that master these technologies. Really, like um, Joe Armstrong uh, is giving a talk, I think, about Erlang. But if you look at reality, you can't hire people. You cannot find people that have these technologies. So try to hire young to your company, you'll fail. Uh, but, but also, even at the hero level, these developers are not immune to make uh, mistakes. Uh, and, and the pattern of successful um, higher scale services, if you look at Twitter, if you look at LinkedIn, if you look at Facebook, they have the same pattern where they re-architected and re rewrote their system three or four times as their usage grew. So they had to throw away uh, the whole solution, essential, not just imp incrementally improve, not just refactor, but throw away the architecture and put the new solution in place at the most critical time where the business was growing. And some people, uh, some people argue that that was the failure of MySpace, that the, the reason MySpace lost competition uh, to Facebook is because they weren't moving fast enough. They couldn't scale with their users, and their experience suffered. They were too slow. So I would argue it's not a, a scalable solution to try to hire uh, more than a handful of hero developers for a company. But then we look at the problems as engineers, but if you talk to business people, they look at it from very clear business lens. Right? They see time to market, um, the return on investment. Those are the terminologies that they use, which means I need to build systems fast, I need to uh, build them cheap, and they need to be reliable so they're cheap to operate. So capital expenditure versus uh, operation expenditure. Um, that, that's why like, my mental picture is so those people are trying to sell you this elevator, one elevator where you push a button and you open the cloud, which is not realistic. It's just uh, oftentimes a bunch of people that don't know what they're selling or the charlatans that are trying to sell you uh, this bridge to nowhere. Uh, in reality, it, you need like a stairway where you can walk or you can run. Uh, because you're in a competition. If, you, if your work in your competition is, is running, then you're losing the competition. So you have to run uh, to stay uh, in the competition. That's an interesting quote from Alice in Wonderland, but the queen says, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that, which is, I think, was about our business. It's not about Alice in Wonderland. It's not for kids. So that's my mental picture is we need a stairway. Something realistic, not climbing like with the ropes, not a uh, magical elevator, but something real. If we step back uh, and see how we've been building uh, services, we didn't call them cloud services uh, a decade ago, but for 15 to 20 years, we've been building them as N-tier, three-tier architecture. This picture must be familiar to everyone, I assume. So you have a stateless layer of front ends. So the web service, uh, servers that uh, terminate client connections, do authentication, uh, DDoS protection, uh, admission control, and then forward requests to middle tier, or, or several tiers, but still it's a middle tier. Stateless, again, middle tier, that goes and talks to storage to pull data in, perform an operation or not, and uh, potentially write data back to storage. So if a request comes for a user profile, middle tier call storage, give me profile for that user, and then I do some update and write back to storage. Or maybe I don't even write update, I return back uh, to the front end to render a web page or re respond to the mobile client. So this, this is a wonderful model. It's beautiful, it's very simple. You can scale easily by adding more servers in the middle tier, more servers in the front end. The problem is storage is much more difficult to scale. So especially if you have a database, like a SQL, Oracle database, at some point you exceed its capacity and it, it burns out, so you cannot scale. And as the industry, we realized that a long time ago. So we put the solution, a cache layer, in front of it. Memcached, Redis, all those solutions, they reduced uh, the load on the storage because now, first time you read it, put data in cache, and then after that, you read it from memory, so which is much faster. You move data between memory, and, and you only go to storage to update. But in reality, that complicated the solution so much. Now you talk to two storages. You have your cache storage, and you have still your call storage. You need to coordinate that, and you need to write updates to both. And um, as you probably know, the cache invalidation problem is one of the hardest problems in distributed systems, fundamentally. So programming this is, is not really nice. Really, I think this is what we want. We, have, we want to have a stateful middle tier, where data would be cached, but also the computer would execute. So this is what I call the stateful middle tier. We have benefits on uh, of both. Instead of putting data in, in cache and running compute somewhere else, can we have them together? Name the tune, anybody knows? 
piece of good together? No? The doors? Um, so th I would argue that's what we want. And that's how we approached Orleans. When we, when we started working on Orleans, we really tackled this kind of two challenges. We wanted to have a probing model which is easy and attainable for a wide range of developers. So you don't have to be a hero developer to understand and, and uh, write successful software with it. But also, we didn't want to turn away expert developers, th those heroes. They, they should like the model as well. And, and the model needs to be flexible enough and powerful enough to empower uh, those developers as well. Uh, so th that, that's the trade-off between simplicity and, and power. But also, we didn't want to make developers 20% or 30% more uh, productive. We wanted to have uh, qualitatively better productivity, and which means three times, five times, ideally 10 times more productive. And the main way we know how to make developers more productive is to have them write less code. Because the best code you write is the code you don't write, because you don't have bugs there. Right? That's paradoxical, but it's true, right? If we can eliminate code from our code base, we eliminate bugs that we didn't introduce there. So that's what we targeted. A goal was to reduce the amount of code you write, but also make the code you write much simpler. So you're much less uh, error prone and more productive uh, in, in writing and, and debugging it and testing it. The second pillar uh, of the project was to make this code scalable by default, which means if you write code following some simple guidelines, there is a good chance you'll build it in such a way that it will scale. So if you have suddenly 10 times more business, 10 times more uh, customers or 100 times more customers, your code will work. You may need to tweak a few, uh, optimize a few places, but you wouldn't have to go and re-architect and throw away uh, the whole thing like uh, in those um, cases, like with LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. So those are kind of conflicting goals in a way. Um, who has heard of, about the actor model? Excellent. So I hope people attended um, yesterday's talk by um, Roger uh, Johansson. Uh, for those who don't know, you can think of actor model as just the distributed object model. So you have these isolated entities that do not have access, direct access to each other's memory. They have to send messages to say, hey, do this for me or give me this value. Um, and they, they, of course, they can create um, other uh, actors. So the model was invented in 1973 by Carl Hewitt a long time ago, and you can imagine there was no cloud, uh, and it was built for a very different purpose. So Qt invented it for a, a, as a concurrency model for single machine, single process systems for AI, artificial intelligence applications. Uh, but as often happens in our industry, nothing is new under the sun, so that, that approach got rediscovered like in the late 80s and 90s uh, by um, Joe Armstrong and at Ericsson to build Erlang. Uh, in, a new implementation of the actor model that they built some uh, control plane systems for uh, their telco equipment. Then later, some distribution features were added through OTP. Uh, in the cloud space, people rediscovered again uh, this model because if you think of it, because you have these independent entities and they exchange messages, they don't have any uh, assumption of locality. So if I'm sending a message from actor A to actor B, I don't assume that they're on the same machine. The implementation of the rhyme time could have been that. Uh, it, that's how it's implemented. But fundamentally, the model allows me to run these actors anywhere they want, as long as I can, as long as I can deliver messages between them. So it's easy to distribute uh, these models and uh, th these modules, uh, these actors. So that's what we took as uh, kind of the base approach for Project Carlene's. Uh, name the tune? No. Also the doors. So we. We didn't want to just go blindly and, and, and look at the models. We, we sort of took an independent approach. And we came up with this, what we later called virtual actors. As we work on the system, as we try it and, and different approaches and threw away some of uh, early versions and work with early customers, we realized there are these challenges, fundamental challenges in uh, existing approaches, an Erlang approach, and ACA is a sort of JVM clone uh, of Erlang. The fundamental uh, difficulty was that in the distributed, highly concurrent system, it's very expensive to write code to coordinate uh, this, this actor. So you need to create an actor for user you the front end receive request for. But what if your three front ends receive requests for the same user? First, they, they need to go check, do we have an actor for this user in some registry? So you do it concurrently, and they get a response, no, we don't. 
all of them three independently realize I need to create a new actor for this user. And of course, they in parallel try to create an actor. And then they need to register in the registry. And all of them but one should fail and should handle this gracefully. Of course, there's a lot of coordination to get right. And of course, that kind of code works fine in a simple unit test. But when you're on scale, suddenly you have this concurrency and race conditions. And that's what we heard from Erlang developers later, that that's actually in, indeed is one of the biggest challenges to build distributed systems with Erlang. So the idea uh, behind a virtual actor is very different. So the analogy is like virtual memory. When, when you write code to, uh, say, touch or update the value in the array um, index x, you never check the, with the operating system, is this memory page in memory, or is it in page file? You don't write code to say, load this page file for me, and then I'll set the value. You just set the value, and it's the operating system's job to realize, oh, this page was in the page file, I'll bring it, up, let you update the value, and then once it gets called, I write it back to page file. So it's the same basic idea. Um, so all actors in Orleans, we call them grains uh, instead of actors to differentiate that actors in Orleans are very different from what people used to think about uh, actors. So that's what we call them grains. So those grains, they kind of always exist virtually. So you can always make a call to any actor in the system um, so long as you know identity of the actor. And a call generally will always succeed regardless of whether the actor is in memory or in, in storage or in the process of being activated. All this complexity of coordination is done by the runtime. So Orleans runtime really performs uh, uh, the heavy lifting. Uh, it's interesting that it, what we discovered, people equated Erlang's approach with actor model is safe. So when we started talking about Orleans, the first reaction was what you build is not an actor model because you don't have supervision trees. So they, they thought that was an axiom in, in the actor model that you have to have a supervision tree to be an actor model, which is actually not true, which Carl Hewitt, no less, said, no, <laughs> that's not the case. His complaint about um, Erlang was kind of similar. We didn't know that uh, to what Orleans uh, did eventually. So you remove all, all this complexity of managing the life cycle of, uh, of these actors, uh, give it to the runtime. As a result, you write less code, and you write simpler code. So that's how we're achieving the goal of uh, developer productivity. So let's look how the code uh, looks in reality. Uh, when, when I'm asked to explain what Orleans is in one sentence, I say distributed C-sharp, which is any kind of two two word or one sentence or 30 second description is not accurate. It's not about C sharp, it's just uh, distributed.net. Uh, but that, that uh, kind of works for people because you, you, you program it with the same paradigm. You have interfaces and you have classes. So you start with the interface. So you define what we call a grain interface. And you define it by uh, in extending one of the marker interfaces. In this case, uh, I use iGrain with GUID key, which says um, actors of, of this type, the grains, they'll have GUID as their identity. And then within this interface, you can have one or more methods. One requirement for, for those methods is that they asynchronous. They return a task, a promise for a value. Who is familiar with TPL task async await? Great, so the majority. Um, those that are not, I think that's the best way in, in, in C Sharp 5.0. That's the best innovation. When I talked to JVM people, when I first started talking to them, they didn't believe me that was true. When we'll see the code, it's just brilliant how it works. So that's the requirement that all calls are asynchronous. So whenever you make a call to, in this case, like hello world, say hello, the result you get, uh, you get it right away. Before anything happens, you get this promise. Task of a string means a promise for a string that will arrive later, maybe milliseconds later, maybe seconds later, but later. So you're not, um, you're not blocking on this line. That's why one requirement is that everything is asynchronous. So when we invoke uh, the grain, this is an example. I just need three lines. I use static uh, class uh, grain factory and say, give me a grain that implements this interface that we defined uh, above for a user with this identity. So I pass the GUID, and what I get back is a, 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 under the covers a proxy object, the variable user, which implements the, the interface that I ask for. It's returned immediately. It's constructed locally. There is no uh, messages uh, involved. And then I can make a call, in this case, users.say hello right away. So the, the first two lines, they will take probably nanoseconds to execute, because they do nothing. You just say, OK, here's a promise for a future result. And then through the magic of await keyword in, in C Sharp 5.0, you can say, 
execute the rest of the method when that result comes back without blocking the thread. So this is very simple. The code looks straightforward and sequential, but in reality, it executes very efficiently because we're not blocking the thread. We're giving up under the covers compiler reaps, of, uh, reaps out the remain, remainder of the method as a continuation and executes the synchronously later. So that's all I need to, uh, to write to make a call to a grain. And once I get a response back, once the weight returns, I can kind of do something with this value. When I implement uh, the grain uh, class, it's also very simple. I extend the base class grain that's in the library, and then I implement one or more interfaces, grain interfaces that I defined. So again, it looks just like your normal uh, object-oriented programming, unlike uh, one-way message passing, state machine, and things like that. You just implement interfaces and classes. But notice also that um, this method say hello has a counter. It increments a counter uh, that's, uh, on, on the last line. And the reason I can do this without any locks, any synchronization, is because every method in, in the grain executes uh, in the single, with a single thread guarantee. So the release runtime guarantees that your code never runs in parallel on more than one thread within uh, a single grain. So you always have full control of your private state. You can always assume that nothing else is touching it. So you don't need to put any in the locks, semaphores, any other synchronization mechanisms, which simplifies your code and removes lots of, again, the bugs. That's the way, th and that's sort of uh, the reflection of the original idea of the concurrency model of vector model, that you, you can write safe code. Nobody else will go and touch your variables as you execute. Even your own methods will not touch it because they only run one at a time. So what, what happens uh, behind the scenes, so grain is, is kind of a logical construct. It always exists, but it, the physical incarnation of it goes through this life cycle. So it can be in persistent storage, and probably most of the time it's there, not, not in memory. And only when the call arrives for a particular grain, the runtime gets and instantiates uh, a physical incarnation of that uh, logical construct we call activation. It goes through initialization, through activation process, where it, if needed, blows its state and calls the method that is kind of like a constructor, say, hey, I'm activating you, do your initialization, and then delivers the request that triggered activation. So for a while, that grain stays in memory, and then the runtime checks what was the last time that a grain got touched, this activation of a grain got touched and got um, a message to process. If it hasn't been called for a while, and by default it's two hours, but it's configurable, you can set one minute, five minutes for different types. So if it was, it was called, nobody sent the message to this grain, there's no need to keep it in memory. So really in runtime, garbage collects. Again, we go through the activation process. Say, hey, I'm about to deactivate you. If you want to do something, here's your chance, and then removes it from memory. So that's the model behind the scenes. On the, on the, program, on the caller side, it, you program as if it's always in memory. But in reality, runtime manages resources and does this distributed asynchronous garbage collection of your resources. And I'll stress again, with no code from the application. Maybe configuration, how, how fast, how aggressive you want this garbage, garbage collection to happen. So if we, if we go back to this picture uh, with this actor-based middle tier, because of this life cycle, what we're really getting is what's in memory is just a sliding window of all possible grains, actors. Only those that were recently used now or within that period before they get garbage collected. An example would be like a major game like Halo or Call of Duty. They sold probably 30, 40, 50 million copies. That doesn't mean that all those users are in memory, uh, are, are active. In fact, you can find very few days in the year when there is more than one million of them playing at the same time. So there is no reason to keep state of 50 million uh, of the players in memory. You can just have those automatically that they actually turn on their console and then they start the game. And as they stop playing the game or shut uh, down their console, their, their grain will be, become cold and will get deactivated. So the runtime does this resource management for you for free. Again, without write, you writing application code for that. So the release runtime, it, it runs like an overlay um, over physical resources or virtual machines. So it, it, on every uh, virtual machine that you run uh, in the cloud or in the physical machine if you run on premises, the, there is one usually process of release runtime called silo. And those silos, they form a cluster automatically. And they start pinning each other to see like, who is up, who is down, if, if 
this Sialodin responds to me three times, I suspect uh, it's probably dead. So it, it does all this magic uh, of uh, tracking the hardware status, essentially. So if, if one of the machines blows up, the runtime automatically detects it and understands what grains were running on that machine. So they're gone, they're lost because the machine disappeared. Maybe it's a, a physical hardware failure or network uh, cable got cut. There are many reasons why a machine uh, disappears. What's important is that once the runtime, this distributed logic realizes we lost this machine, it knows that grains are running there are not running anywhere anymore. So it can place them when the new requests arise for a grain that used to be there to a different machine. So you can operate with the cluster without that machine for a while. And then if that machine gets, gets repaired or restarts and comes back, it joins the cluster again and becomes another resource to place these grains and execute more. All of that is done by the runtime again. So you don't need to write any code. Your individual request may fail. So you make a call to your grain and you may get uh, an error back. And you may get an error back for many different reasons, like storage is unavailable or, or something else. Or the machine just died in this window before the runtime realizes it's dead, you may get a failure. But fundamentally, you can keep repeating this request and eventually it'll succeed once all these conditions get uh, re recovered. So you don't need to write code to understand where things run or what state they're on. You, you just write your code in a simple manner as if they always um, exist and always in memory. Um, so besides Hello World, let, let's look at something more uh, com complicated than that. Um, Let's see, see, this is the, a made up of social network example. So I have notion of a friend. So I have this user interface, but I have a, a method to add a friend myself. So notice that um, in the method signature, I can use uh, I user as an argument type. So the runtime knows how to serialize these references and how to pass them around without you writing any code. In fact, the compile time we generate serializers to efficiently pass uh, data, data types and preserve uh, them um, as if uh, nothing happened, as if they're on the same machine. So we define the interface, and then let's see how we implement um, uh, executing this method. So first two lines get two references uh, for, for two grains, for me and for my friend. Like in, in the Halo World example, just say, give me a reference for, for this grain with, uh, of this type with this identity. And then what I do, I just call my grain, say, add a friend, and, and pass directly this reference. What's important to, to understand here is that the reference is logical. It's always valid. It doesn't point to a physical machine, physical IP address, URL, nothing like that. It just encapsulates the type and identity of the grain. So it's always valid. I can save it in a database. I can shut down my system. I can restart it a week later. I can read this record and make a call to this grain, and the call will succeed because the runtime will activate grain with that identity, deliver my request, and execute it, and deliver a response to me. So unlike physical references, these are logical references that are always valid. Um, one thing here which is not so obvious is we're making horizontal calls. So these grains, they live in the same level uh, in this middle tier. If, if you go back to the picture of three-tier architecture, if I had the logic for one user to make a call to another user, I would have to go all the way out to the web service and make a call to user service and pass uh, target user ID as one of the arguments, go all the way through uh, front ends to another uh, middle tier server to execute this request. Here, the whole call uh, happens in the middle tier. So just direct communication between, uh, between those grains on the same layer. The other thing uh, uh, that is interesting here, we put try catch. But as you can imagine, the caller, my grain, and my friend's grain can be on three different machines. So how come we can catch an exception here? So here's the picture to, to demonstrate it uh, a little bit better. So say we have a front end that receive request, made a call to grain A to process this request. As part of this uh, logic of processing, that grain called another grain of a different type, maybe on another machine, which in its turn may call to the grain C to, to do its part of logic. Uh, and, and imagine grain C through an exception. For example, uh, the friend you passed to me is already in your friend list, so you're not allowed to add him twice. Or this friend, you, th this person cannot be your friend for whatever reason. Um, so traditionally, what you have to do, you have to analyze the return result and then propagate the return result back and then propagate it back again. What happens in Orleans, if you write no code, zero, 
for error handling here. That exception from C will be delivered to caller B. And if B has no try catch, it will automatically propagate to A. And if A doesn't have try catch, it will propagate to the original caller. We call clients of code that runs on, on a front end, not within uh, the grain space. We call them Orleans clients. So this exception will be automatically propagated all the way up with no code. I can put try catch anywhere I want. For example, I may decide to put it in C or in B. But by default, it will be propagated if, if I put no code. And as I mentioned before, the error handling code is the, uh, the code that usually is the buggiest, because that's the code that's uh, hardest to test. So what we get here is essentially distributed asynchronous try catch semantics, uh, with the very powerful construct that I can only put code where actually ne uh, needed. In most of these cases, I can do nothing. I cannot retry or, or do anything to fix an error. I just need to report to end user that your request failed, and here's the error code or description to receive from the exception. So I can do that at the front end layer and just render a web page or respond to mobile client. So that's actually a very powerful feature um, of the runtime. So look at uh, another example, still staying within the social um, uh, network uh, sort of theme. But when you say social network, uh, don't think just Facebook or Twitter or those kind of things. Like ga gaming, like a multiplayer game is a social network. It's just a much more fluid where these relations are formed for a, a multiplayer session and then they dissolve and then users join different sessions. This is essentially social graph. If you're talking about IoT devices, it's kind of the same but mu much more static. You have sensors, you have rooms, you have buildings. So you have these uh, relations, uh, social graph kind of relations. So it's not limited to just a tra traditional notion of um, a social network. So imagine I need a method to return the status of all my friends. Like, for example, my stupid UI wants to render a table with friend, status, friend, status, friend, status. And let's say I'm very popular, I have a thousand friends. So if I were to do it naively and call one friend at a time, get response back, then call another friend and get response back, even if the latency of a single call is, is very short, if it's, say, 10 milliseconds, if I call 1,000 friends um, serially, the minimum latency of uh, the whole series of calls would be 10 seconds, 10 milliseconds uh, times 1,000. So of course, I don't want to do, uh, do that. I want to call them in parallel. And that's what's very easy to do um, to fan out calls in early. So in these two lines of for each, where we call friend.getStatus, and remember, getStatus returns a promise, a task, for, for a result, which we put in, in list right away. So this whole for each, again, will execute it within nanoseconds or microseconds. It doesn't do anything. It just prepares those messages to be sent. And then through the magic of TPL and, and async await, we can join this, in my example, 1,000 promises into one, the task that will be resolved when all of them uh, get responded to, and then await it. So with this one line, we await all the responses. And then once all the responses arrive, we can process the results and render uh, my uh, the web page, my stupid table with uh, friend statuses. So in the few lines of code, we fan out uh, uh, requests and, and the process results very easily. It's, it's very um, easy to do these kind of patterns. Um, so in the ideal case, our ideal latency is the latency of a single call. But also notice that, again, we didn't put any multi-threaded code, no blocking. We, we, we do nothing here that would be out of the ordinary. So we write as if it's a, a single process code, uh, in a single uh, application uh, running on a single machine. But we get a lot of parallelism. So you have enough cores, all these calls will be executed in parallel. So it feels like a desktop app, but actually runs on the cluster. Who's familiar with MPI? There's a few people. So that's a library for. Um, very efficient distributed uh, uh, computations. So there's this um, famous professor, Dennis Gannon. He told me a couple of years ago, he said, we don't want to teach our students MPI anymore because it's very hard to get it right. With our links, it's so much easier to do it. You can implement the same patterns, but with much fewer lines of code, with uh, much simpler uh, code. And I was so happy when Carl Hewitt, the inventor of the actor model, wrote this thing um, last year in his paper. So he said that in his Orleans uh, a couple paragraphs, said that it's an important step in further the goal of the actor model that application program need not be so concerned with low level system details. So that's exactly what we try to achieve, to raise the level of abstraction to make developers more productive and code the right simple. 
uh, and, and I, I think I tweeted at the time that uh, I'm ready to retire. And they checked my um, savings account and decided to stay to work. <laughs> Not ready yet. Uh, but interestingly enough, in another uh, survey, um, Carl Hewitt pointed to uh, Erlang's deficiencies, lack of error propagation, which I showed you exactly what we put in, only it's not knowing that that was his concern, and also lack of resource management. Those are his two complaints about Erlang, which you see, without knowing that, we implemented exactly those things in Orleans. Um, there are many features, like I, I just highlighted a couple uh, of them. So there's declarative persistence. You can, you can declare a uh, state for your grain class as uh, a property back class, just very simple POCO class. And then you pass it as a type argument to um, uh, the base class grain when you declare your, your user, in this example, user grain class. And then you get this uh, method, the state property uh, of the type um, that we declared as the POCO class. And you have this, usually you use a single method, write state is sync. This is where you say persist my state. I set my properties persisted uh, to storage. And how it works, there is a plugin model, there are persistence providers. So you don't have to write code against specific storage like uh, Azure Blob or SQL or like, uh, uh, S3 in, in AWS. You just write a single line and then provider will uh, know how to deliver this uh, state update to specific storage. How you link them is through this, uh, 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 this attribute. You say, I want to use a provider with this name. And then in the config, you can declare that uh, this name is for uh, Azure table storage. So you can change your, your storage and th that you target the code without changing application code. You may need to migrate your data if you decided to move, but you don't have to change your code at all. You just change your config. But this is an opt-in feature. You don't have to use it. You can just write code where you talk to storage directly yourself. So it's up to you, just a convenience feature. Um, so we, we included uh, a few providers uh, with the code base, but there are others that are built in by the community for storages we wouldn't even consider building ourselves. Uh, another feature that we added maybe a year ago, slightly more, um, came from this need that when people used uh, Orleans and see this RPC pattern, when you call and you get a response, a request, uh, request response uh, remote procedure call a pattern. You say, well, I want to return a series of values, or I want to subscribe to um, values that um, somebody will produce. I want to produce a series of values. So you're talking about streams. And we had a stream API, which is a single API over different delivery mechanisms. So there are like three categories. There's direct TCP messaging, where you just want to deliver uh, this asynchronous updates directly over um, these connections between silos just by sending messages, no persistence. Or you may do the same over uh, durable queues like Azure Queue or SQS, uh, Event Hub. Uh, actually, Event Hub is in the third category. It's Kafka and Event Hub, they're in a different category by themselves because they're not really queues. They're distributed uh, partition logs where you can say, I want to go back to this, uh, this um, offset in the log and re-deliver messages from that point. It's a very different uh, very powerful model, but we have a single API that works across all the three of them. I would say it's a controversial decision to have one API over three because they have different enough semantics. So, so we question that decision, but that's what we did. We put a single API, and if you look at how it works, I call provider, again, by name because it's driven, config driven, like with the persistent provider. And then say, give me a string, uh, stream of integers with this ID. ID is a GUID. So again, like we, we took the, uh, the virtual actor model and made it virtual streams. So as so long as you know identity of the stream, you can always produce or consume from it. You don't need to create it. You don't need to find it. Just say, I want to produce a stream with this ID, or I want to consume from a stream with this ID. So you have GUID and the namespace. So it's easy to model things like user and user ID X, or device and device ID Y and then produce or consume uh, messages. And you produce by just calling on next they sync. We model API uh, on Rx, uh, or a sync version that was supposed to be coming. That's not a controversial decision because we took naming from Rx, which may not be obvious or uh, the best choice uh, for naming. We just try to be consistent with Rx. But regardless, you, put, you call on next they sync and produce a value, or you can produce a batch of values. And on the consumer side, 
you define your handler, which will be invoked, and you subscribe, say, for that stream, I want to subscribe my handler. So it will be invoked when every um, value, every event uh, on the stream arrives. Uh, and, that's all, uh, and that's it. So it's very few lines of code. And again, those streams, they're virtual. They exist the whole time. You don't have to do anything uh, about managing them. But also, the streams work not just between grains. They work between the client, like the front end, uh, and, and grains in both directions. So it's a very symmetrical model. So if you have front end that terminates WebSocket connections or MQP connections, it's easy for that client to subscribe to e the event streams from grains and deliver updates in uh, this low latency interactive scenarios. So that's what it was built for. Um, there is a lot of complexity under the hood to make this work. So there's sort of pooling agents, so you need to distribute work. If you run a cluster of 100 uh, nodes, each node needs to pull from queues if you're using like Event Hub uh, or Azure queues. And if machines go up and down, each distribute this work. You need to cache this to be efficient. So there's, there's a lot of complexity there uh, to deal with that. And again, that, that complexity is done primarily by the runtime. So the application code can stay simple, but the uh, performance will still be powerful and, and, and robust in dealing with failures and, and redistribution automatically. For that, we'll, we'll leverage um, a bunch of other uh, Orleans capabilities to run it smoothly. Uh, name the tune. Everybody knows when tomorrow comes. No? Eurythmics. I'm going to drink beer with myself. <laughs> uh, so we, when we built, uh, years ago, when we built the uh, first couple of applications uh, on Orleans, and we started talking internally to uh, pro proto groups and saying, look, this thing seemed to work. Uh, but as usual, like, people in our industry are skeptical. They'll look at it and say, it's too simple. It's too good to be true. If it's that simple, there's probably like, a lot of things it cannot do. So there was like, a lot of disbelief until this guy came. Uh, what happened, um, Hoops and, Moi, like, uh, and those guys, they came to us and say, look, we, we, build, uh, we designed this architecture for our future services. But then we discovered Orleans, the paper, and it looks like you implemented 80% of it and much better and deeper than we thought we would. So why don't we join forces and work on the remaining piece? Oh, and by the way, we need to be in production in three months. And this is where, like, in the quote in the video is, is real, true story. I turn to my team and say, once they left the room, these guys are crazy. If you want to take technology from Microsoft Research and put it in production in three months, I don't know what they're thinking, but let's drop everything and help them be successful. And we put this service in production, the first service for, I think it was Halo Reach University Edition, uh, in three months. And it worked fine. We worked out a couple of bugs after launch, but nothing um, broke uh, the experience. And, and they decided that this far exceeded our expectations. We're going to standardize and release for uh, the next major release, which was Halo 4. And so Halo 4, all of the services for it were built over the release uh, within six, seven months with very small team. So it was very productive, successful launch, high scale, all of that. We proved that it worked. So that removed very much all concerns that Orleans is a toy, it's too simple. People were saying, if it works for Halo, it must work for me, and because I'm uh, smaller scale. And then we had this other uh, gamers uh, came. Uh, anybody played um, Age of Empires, Halo's uh, Castle Siege? Uh, so it, the back end runs on Orleans. And of course, uh, in the fall, we had Halo 5 release, which was very smooth, where we were asked to be on call for the weekend, and on Friday we said we were told nobody needs to come. It runs smoothly. I think it's good. Um, and then came kind of non-gamers. Uh, we have a couple of services that are built for Skype. We have uh, several services in in Azure monitoring and security. There's this uh, fancy IoT project we're launching uh, this uh, device into stratosphere, like 40 kilometers and uh, very high. Um, this applications that you have on Windows or on Windows Phone, if anybody has a Windows Phone still, um, they may not look as sexy, but they all have like hundreds of millions of users behind them. So it's still a lot of scale, a lot of data to deliver. Uh, another game, uh, Gears of War, uh, is going to be released this fall. It's also using the same back end. Um, we never design our links for gamers, which is like paradoxical. People keep asking, oh, you build it for Halo. No, we didn't build it. We didn't even have it in mind. They came to us when we had the system. But I think why, um, why gamers come first, it's like 
typical in our industry because they have a very different environment. They're always on the bleeding edge. They're always under a lot of pressure. They always rewrite a lot of code for the next release. And their load is unforgiving. So they have this spike on the first few hours, few days of launch, which is very different from any other service. Whatever you hear about Snapchats and, and whatnot, they have the user base growing over time. So they have time to fix things up. Things don't scale. If performance drops down, they have time, months and years, to improve and even re-architect. If a major game is released and it has a problem if you uh, first few hours or a few days, you lost the business. This, this users will just trash and, and it's just unforgivable. So it's a very risky business. And also the economics are shifting. So the, this uh, business of, of selling DVDs or Best Buy uh, and other retailers is slightly going away. So it's moving more towards virtual goods, virtual currency, content delivered through cloud. A lot of logic goes to the cloud. So they need to be in the cloud to stay in business, stay uh, competitive. So they're good customers to work with because they're very fast, very ambitious. Name the tune. Great. Um, so when you talk to on read analysts, they, they talk about quadrants, magic quadrants. So I thought, why can't I have uh, Sergey's magic quadrants and, and define my own? Yes, it's also a queen. So the interactive entertainment goes beyond gaming. You have interactive TV, uh, other um, similar types of applications. When you have sub-second latency requirements and you have high scale, you need to deliver things um, tailored to a specific user and analyze things on the fly, which kind of bleeds into near real-time analytics, has a different angle, but similar requirements of getting data and quickly making decisions. And then funny enough, if you look at fraud detection, fraud detection for credit cards is not that different actually from cheat detection in games, very similar approaches. IoT is, is the hottest area, so that's why I put us, I think, subconsciously as red. And we have this project I'm, I'm most proud of that people build all these, uh, this thermostats for Honeywell, uh, Ryan Orleans, or the project where literally build a system to control up to 2 million of mousetraps, because the company services um, other businesses with mousetraps. Uh, and they need to know when they need to go and come when the mouse is there. So it's a funny IoT project. Uh, and the other one is uh, this green power storage facility in Hawaii on Oahu, uh, which stores up to half uh, a gigawatt uh, of power, which some, some people wrote it's like a small like, nuclear power plant, but it's just storage for uh, wind turbines and um, solar panels. But there are many more things that are possible. As I showed with these patterns, and I show you just a glimpse of it, but there's much more that is possible. You can build all kinds of scale-out computer applications with, with these primitives. Uh, we open source our links in January 2015. Um, the experience exceeded, far exceeded all our expectations. So it's a very different experience. Of Thank you. It's, yes, it is from Sting. If you love somebody, set them free. Uh, it, it's just a great experience of dealing with all these people out there that collectively are much smarter than you are. So you have to be very humble once you go through the experience because you can never be as smart as all of them. And, and they're all passionate. They come there because they want to contribute, not because somebody asked them to. And that helped hiring. I had no problem hiring five people just last couple of months because they say, look, you'll be paid to work on an open source project and you'll be building your GitHub profile for your uh, future employees. The best deal, uh, I think, in town. That worked. That also will help uh, move uh, Orleans, uh, the core CLR, and make it cross-platform. Uh, because there are people that want to do this work with us. So we don't have to do all the work. We, we have to coordinate with the community, but a lot of work can be done by the community itself. Uh, one important uh, thing about Orleans is that it runs everywhere. Like we don't want to, it's not locked into Azure. There's this misconception that Reliance is for Azure. No, it's not. You can run anywhere. You can run it in your closet and your garage on some hardware that you, you purchased uh, off eBay. Uh, you can run AWS. Some people do that. You can run anywhere. And it's not tied to anything through so this um, confi flexible configuration and provider models. You're not constrained by where to run. And usually Microsoft is viewed as fast follower in a lot of technologies. I'm proud to say that in this case, uh, JVM people were fast followers. So there's this Orbit uh, JVM clone of Orleans, and they told us very explicitly, they, they wrote about Orleans, they heard about it, and they got blown away by uh, the model. Uh, but because they were a JVM shop, their 
Bioware is one of the electronic arts companies. Just implemented the same model in, in, in JVM, and they like it. And Roger uh, Johansson is was somewhere here. He's trying to do something similar in Go. Uh, we moved out of research. <laughs> Great, thank you. People know it. Uh, we moved out of research about a year and a half ago, but we continue uh, to product group, but we continue uh, working with research. It's just a couple of projects that we've been doing recently. One is geo distribution. So all pictures I was showing there are about a single cluster of the Ryan Norlin service, uh, cluster of machines. So we went further from a single node, single cluster, multi-cluster. So instead of one cluster, you run this kind of a constellation of clusters. And you can geo-distribute them. You can put them in different geographies for locality, but also for availability. So if one of them goes down, the model stays the same. So you program, again, against these grains that are always available. The fact that one data center went down, that shouldn't be your concern in application logic. The code should work, and the grain will be reactivated somewhere else in a different geography if needed. But you also can serve uh, your, your local customers from the nearest data center automatically. Uh, the famous Phil Bernstein, who co-invented uh, acid transactions, he's working on adding acid uh, tr cross-grain transactions to Orleans, and they're very far in that project and have some very promising numbers. We have other uh, uh, optimization um, paper was in the URC, uh, this year in London a few months ago, published optimizations. Um, but looking why I think why this model works, uh, I would say that there are at least a couple things that need to consider. So one is this contextual orientation. Because you have, or at least model works when they have lots and lots of independent contexts, like users, sessions, devices. If you have this kind of application requirements, this is where the model works. If you want to build distributed databases, I would advocate against using Orleans for it, when you have lots of uh, rows and you need to write uh, an operation that goes across them. That will not be efficient. Uh, in Orleans. But when you have these independent contexts, it's easy to scale them out. It's easy to express the logic in this isolated um, uh, manner of actors. But also, I would argue that uh, this approach brings um, object-oriented view back. And I, I, I'm arguing that uh, it's more natural. The world is not service-oriented. I use an example when, say, in African savannah, when the lion is talking to a gazelle through his clothes and teeth, He's not talking to gazelle service ID X. These two actors interact independently from other lions and other gazelles in the savanna. So that's the reality of the natural world where things are not service oriented. They're object oriented, distance oriented. And this model fits it well. Uh, in the paper, we have a graph that shows uh, that we scale linearly. And actually, numbers now are 50% higher, but that's the graph from the paper. So if we get back to uh, this business uh, requirements uh, picture of time to market, uh, return on investment, um, I would argue that more or less we, we hit the first three requirements. So I hope I demonstrated developed productivity. Linear scalability, um, you can uh, find details in the paper. But I also didn't touch uh, a lot on high efficiency. Our Lean's code is very efficient. Th that's why we build our own serialization layer, one of the reasons. So, and people measured against some competition and found that's, I forgot, 23 or 26 times faster than uh, something out there. Um, so we, don't, we didn't sacrifice efficiency for simplicity. That's why I think we, we, we didn't solve the world problem, but I think we gave enough tools to address a class of applications uh, in a very easy and very powerful way. That's my, my, my claim to you, and I would encourage you as a takeaway to take a look at our lanes uh, take a look at open source, if you've never done that. Uh, if you're a JVM, look at Orbit. Uh, even if you cannot apply these kind of technologies, maybe the approach will resonate later in, in your work and when you build your system. Kind of learn from our experience, from our mistakes, but also learn that questioning uh, established uh, wisdom sometimes pays off. So you don't have to have supervision trees, I would argue. So that's all I have for you. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I can answer now or later. I was wondering, what, what's the relation to service fabric actors, and are there any uh, important differences? Uh, the question is, uh, what are the relations with service fabric actors and other related differences? Yeah, um, so first of all, 
the service fabric, the whole name conveys that service fabric is about service model, about, service, uh, about distributing, um, running services, managing services. That's the primary reason for a service fabric. So it's, Orleans is about implementing services. So yes, service fabric includes uh, some libraries that got a column program models, but they're more like libraries, and one of them is actor-oriented. But it, even though the APIs are very similar, like the, the simple APIs, in the reality, the implementation is very different because it's built to highlight other features of service fabric, or for example, replicated uh, local uh, attached storage. While in Orleans, it's all uh, uh, remote. The partitioning story is different, the placement is different, the, there's a lot of differences there. So that, that's why I would suggest you look at um, those differences and see which case works for you. The question is, uh, what my insights into why uh, Service Fabric team decides to build uh, reliable actors. Uh, like, like I said, so the reliable actors highlight features in, in Service Fabric that are specific to Service Fabric. For, for example, is replicated storage and uh, in general in memory replication. So you have these features, you, you have to, to leverage these features, you need to write uh, service code. And they're different, like they have uh, stateless services and stateful services. They just added this third model that actually can leverage these features in a different way. So I think that, that's the biggest reason to kind of showcase the features of the underlying infrastructure. Any other questions? So the question about uh, hosting your links, so can you run it on premises on the single machine uh, in the cloud? The answer is all, yes to all of this. So yes, you can run it on a single machine, like, especially like developer experience with F5 debugging is very easy because you run two nodes within app domains of the same process where your client runs. So that makes it very easy to debug and, and develop. So you can deploy a single uh, machine because it's just the process you start and the configuration you give it. Uh, you can run on-premises. In fact, our nightly tests are performance measures uh, and, and reliability as they run on the private cluster of uh, some hardware that we inherited for some reason. And then moving from is on-premise or local development to uh, Azure hosted in mobile? It's no problem because it's really about storing membership information, which we recommend to use Azure Table anyway because it's very cheap. We write just a few lines there. You'll pay pennies a month. Even if you run, you can do it even if you run on premises. That's, that's how we run our tests. So we run on private cluster, but we store membership information in Azure table. So then moving this code to say a, a worker role or uh, to a scale set, a VM scale set is very, very easy because the whole mechanism stays the same. Any other questions? So instead of questions about, thank you. So instead of questions about the messaging and delivery guarantees, so messaging between actors is over TCP between two nodes where those grains are on, or single node if they're together. Um, the guarantee is at least once, uh, but but we don't we we had retry logic and it's there you can enable it, but we turn it off by default because in case of failures when you keep retrying and deliver messages that can get there you just exacerbate the problem. So we usually don't recommend uh, to apply a retry logic. Um, but there is also, the one thing I didn't mention, there is a built-in timeout. So when you make a call to a grain, uh, internally a timer starts. And when there is no response within a set period of time, then you get a timeout exception. So it, either your message gets delivered or you get a timeout exception. That's the typical case. So when there is no failure, you, you get a response or maybe an exception, which is fine. But the retry, we recommend living to the application logic because in many cases you don't want to retry. You want to do it once and if it failed, it's too late to retry, for example. So it's in memory, it's not queued, it's not persisted unless you use 
streams. So streams can go over persistent storage. Uh, but messages, general messages, then, and method calls go over TCP. Does that answer your question? Comparison with persistent queues. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's the throughput question. So all persistent queues, they, they have limits on, on throughput and uh, latency or both. Right? So this, this model is the most performant because you don't write to any storage. You just send it directly. But if you need, to, if you need to guarantees, then you can use streams and go over persistent queues as easily. So that's sort of one of the trade-offs uh, you, you need to decide on early on. But you can change it, of course. Uh, you had an example earlier with the streams where you added a, a handler to a stream. Mm -hmm. um, does that happen inside a grain? So if that yes. grain goes to sleep, does that handler then disconnect? Or is that kept somewhere that gets all the new messages? Excellent question. About um, handlers that are attached to a stream, when you subscribe to a stream, what happens with this handler uh, if, if grain goes out of memory, is it persistent or not? It is not persisted, um, primarily because we couldn't serialize uh, delegates and we couldn't do the magic work we won at first, but it was not uh, possible to do. Uh, so the typical pattern is there's this method on activated sync, which is like a constructor of a grain, which gets called when the grain is activated. So this is where you put the logic to retouch your handler. So when your grain, uh, when uh, the message arrives and the grain is not in memory, it gets activated, the method gets called, you touch a handler, and then the, uh, the event gets delivered. That's so how you... Yeah, you need to persist that you subscribe to the stream and then retouch your handler. You have to do it, unfortunately. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you then. <laughs>